Hello and welcome once again to Beyond Gardens Live. This is the third program in the series. If you've joined us before, welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome in particular. This is how it works. You dictate what we talk about. We being the panel in the studio. Can I introduce them to you, please? John McWilliams. Hello. On my right, your left. And on my left and your right, Gary Hetty. And between the three of us, we will attempt to answer all your gardening queries. There are a couple of ways you can get in touch. Yes, so you can call us on 6468 5994 and also email uh, tv at beyondgardens.com.au. And I stress the word is live. Now, this program is brought to you by Beyond Garden sponsors. Uh, we are sponsored for this program by the Water Corporation, by the City of Mandurah, by the City of Stirling, and also by the City of Swan. And we do thank those people for their sponsorship. Um, it is through their support that we can, in fact, bring this program to you. And it is uh, a delightful one. It's proved very popular in the past couple of weeks. Let's hope we can do the same again this week. But uh, as I stress, we rely upon you to get in touch with us. And don't forget, if you are sending <coughs> emails, that you can send the pictures in with them too. We thought we'd get underway this week uh, by taking a visit to Wanneroo. It was almost a couple of weeks ago now that John and I went up there uh, to help them with the establishment of a vegetable garden. And of course, when you do that, you really have to start down at ground level. Here we are down at Cockman House. It's, it's uh, the oldest residence in Wanneroo today here for the Heritage Day. And we're just doing some preparations of the veggie gardens. Now in sandy soils in Western Australia, the first thing we need to do is add clay. We're just adding a clumping clay here. It's a bentonite clay at about two kilos per square metre. So now that we've added the clay, we've still yet to mix it in, but before we mix it in, we're gonna add some compost to the soil. Adding organic matter here in the form of compost is gonna help feed the soil, help retain the water, help retain the nutrients, but really stimulate those microorganisms and fungi. I have noticed we're not adding a huge amount of organic matter. When you add too much organic matter, over 15-20%, you're going to start getting a lot of problems with the soil. Here we've added 10% organic matter, which is a bag of compost per square metre mixed into the top 30 centimetres of the soil. And now that we've prepared the bed with the organic matter and the clay, mixed to a depth of 300 millimetres, it's time to start planting. Our volunteers today are Isaac, Toby and Matilda. Come on in guys, I'll show you how to plant some lettuce. Come out. Be very gentle when you pull them out of there. Make a small hole. Pop them in. Crack the soil around. And away we go. Do you want to find some more? Okay. Um. So now that we've improved the soil and watered the garden, the thing is, is to keep that water in the ground. We've got to stop that evaporative loss, and the way to do that is rough, coarse, irregular shaped mulch. And our thanks to the good folks at Wanneroo for making yeah. us feel so welcome at that particular event. It was, in fact, a great day. And a lot of interest being shown in soil improvement because we spend a lot of time talking about this, don't we? Yeah, we actually do. And, and the big problem is that people get a bit carried away now and, and they're going for a lot more organic matter than they actually need. And it uh, costs you a lot of money and can cause all sorts of problems. And we'll talk a bit about that later on. We will, a little bit later. But uh, if you've got sandy soil and you want to improve it, well, John... 
He's very good, isn't he? <laughs> John is the person to show you how to do it. You'd never guess I do hard work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we remind you, this is Beyond the Gardens Live. I'm John Cobble. I'm joined by John McWilliams and Gary Hetty. And we are waiting your call. So we, we know from past experience that in the last half an hour or so of the program, the calls just bank up and we can't get to them all. So be an early bird. Get in quick. What's that number, John? Uh, 64685994. Or you can email us. On TV at beyondgardens.com.au. And we have, in fact, got some emails in already. Uh, but before we do that, we thought we might uh, mention a related subject, something to do with the seasonal change that takes place at this time of year. You see, there is an incredible amount and diversity of life in the garden that we normally don't see. But it's critically important for the health of the garden overall. I'm talking about the fungi. But it's only when the weather changes, it cools down a bit, we get some moisture, that the fungi make their presence felt by throwing up their fruiting bodies, and it's quite spectacular. <laughs> And there you go, just a few of the, I think, many thousands of different fungi that we'll see. Now, can I just put this all in proportion? Because a lot of people, when they see things popping up out of the ground or growing off trees, automatically assume that the ground's going to be poisoned or the trees are going to die. Out of all those pictures you just saw, only one is actually a harmful fungi. In fact, there are only about three that can cause damage. Um, and the one that is harmful is this one. It's called uh, armillaria. It can pose a bit of a problem on living plants, also known as the honey fungus. Um, has the wonderful name of armillaria lutobubilina. Um, that's one for the quiz nights. So if you see that one, perhaps you should get worried. But with all the others, I would suggest you rejoice because they're the sign of a really healthy garden. And you can see why it's called honey fungus, really. It's yep. a beautiful golden yep. colour. OK, we have our first caller of the evening. Um, uh, yeah, so are you there? Caller? So we'll say hello. Yes, that's right. Oh, hello. hello. You sound distant. All our callers play is if you're yes. queuing on the line, you can probably listen to the programme. But one of the things that, uh, and I neglected to mention it earlier, one of the things you should do is turn the sound of your television down because there is a delay and it will throw you. Um, so, hello. Are you on there? Hang on. Hello. hello. Yeah. Oh, well, there we go. We've definitely got a caller now. Hello. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know who you are, so if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and where you're from, that saves us a lot of trouble. <laughs> you can tell this is live television. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have one caller, two callers, or three callers at the moment? Okay. I think we lost that one. Yep. Okay, we try? Yep, we'll go to we the try? next. I think we'll go to the next caller. Yes. Another one. Uh, this is Chandler. G'day, mate. How are you? Oh, we're Good. well, oh, thank you. We're clear. well. And listen, uh, oh, my roommate he just like skipped town the other day, and I've got no idea where he is. He owes me a bit of money on rent, 
So I went through his room, and um, all I can could I find just... was these two plants growing in his closet. Uh, your and... voice, okay, thank you. We'll go your, on to the next call. Your I voice think. is strangely familiar. The yes. same guy who tried it last week. Yes. So uh, let's move on. Please don't try that again. Um, let's move okay, on to another yes. call. The next call is ready. Hello. Hello. There you go. Uh, we're going well. That's good. Um, name's Mr Horton, mm -hmm. and I've got a little query. Yes. Regarding Kaikui. Yes. Oh, yes. I'd like to know how to get rid of it. I was going to say, do you, <laughs> do you want it or do I've, you want to get rid of it? I've tried three, six, um, Glyphosate 360. Yes. And it hasn't done the job. Mm -hmm. It's grown about oh, 18 inches or more. Keep cutting it, keep growing, keep cutting it, keep growing. It's, Give it up um, on that idea. Yeah, it's, it's very, uh, very prevalent, uh, sorry, very fast growing at this time of year. It'll sit all over uh, summer months and almost do nothing. But once the first rain comes and it cools down, yeah, you've got a hay crop in no time at all. I guess mm -hmm. the question is, is it growing in amongst other things? Well, the only thing I've got, the only thing I've got in the area is a lemon tree. Okay, all right. Um, then I think you should be able to treat it, but we need to talk about the best way to use a glyphosate-based herbicide because um, a lot of people don't quite get it right. Um, it is a very effective herbicide, providing you follow a few simple guidelines. And the first is to have a vigorous growing plant. Yes, absolutely. Not, not difficult. No, <laughs> particularly when it comes to kai no. Um Sometimes a lot of people, uh, what they do is they leave the runners to get too long and they almost get quite fibrous and they, they almost shield the rest of the grass. So if you just spray the top, uh, the rest of the grass can come through and it, it yeah. doesn't really kill it. So I, I, if I've got really long grass that I'm looking at killing, I'll, I'll give it a mow and then that will certainly stimulate the, the growth because the plants have to be actively growing for that glyphosate to work. Very, yeah, very important yeah. point. And, and then you can also cheat a bit by um, tricking the plant into taking, more, taking in more of the chemical than perhaps it might otherwise. There's two ways you can do this. One is to add an extra what's called sticking agent, so it actually sticks on the leaves. And the second is to add a tiny bit of nitrogen, and I do mean a tiny bit, pure nitrogen in the form of urea, and we're only talking about maybe a pinch yep. in a, in a you know, five-litre spraying thing. Um, and then, um, possibly number three, to wrap up this, is to make sure that when you spray it, you spray it all. So you do it all in one head. It's no good doing little bits at a time, because it's got massive storage underground. You've got to be able to do the whole lot above ground to get the maximum absorption of the chemical. I'll give, you, I'll give you a little tip with it. Yep. It's a 20 foot by 50 foot area I want to kill. Yes. Yep. 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 So uh, I would suggest you use your garden hose and use, yep. it, use it so that you as a line so that you can divide the lawn into strips and make sure you get every single bit. Yes. How do I go with a dog? Uh, Fine. Yep, yep. But, but don't spray him because he yeah, won't die. Don't spray the dog. <laughs> also, at this time of the year, just watch. <laughs> At this time of the year, also just watch for that morning dew that sits on the lawn. The lawns it can't be can't be quite it can't be wet from irrigation or morning mm. dew when you spray because it. Well, I haven't out. watered it. I've never watered. Yeah, no, no, no I, you I don't believe have to. that. <laughs> so, so I'd add a couple more things for using 360. Is make sure you're using high quality water. All water is no good. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing too is go right back to stage one and read the label. They give you a rate that you need to use. And you need to yep. make sure that you follow that because you've got to trick the plant into bringing the chemical into its root system and they start killing from the roots up. So you yeah. shouldn't see, a, see any death of that kaikuyu for probably at least a week, maybe even two. Otherwise, yep. you're just burning the leaves and that keeps coming back all the time. A few different formulations mm -hmm. around now. Yeah, no, done that. They're, <laughs> all, they're all fairly good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, OK, right, well, yes. thanks very much, yeah, boys. Good luck, that. That's right. fine. And maybe no just thanks. the one point I think you were referring to, Gary, but perhaps we didn't say quite so precisely is if it says 36 grams or 3.6 grams a litre, that's what you use. Yeah. Uh, if you double the strength, you, in fact, weaken it. It doesn't work as well. Absolutely. That, okay. um, that would probably... That was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's I should good. say, I've, yep. I've got to pick, just to wrap this up, um, there is a new form of kaikuyu round, it's called yes. village green. Not that a picture of grass means very much, but this is what village green looks like. Yep. Not quite as vigorous as the other one. And one of its claimed features, and I haven't been able to verify this yet, is that it doesn't set seed, whereas normal Ooh. wide kaikuyu does. 
and that's in many cases how you get kaikuyu when you didn't plant it in yes. the first place. Very fine okay. airborne seed. Um, and that probably <coughs> the application rates of the glyphosate certainly would lead into our next topic tonight of garden myths. Oh, we're on to garden myths, are yeah. we? Yes. yes. Well, well, you're ready. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so we will be. So we, tonight's, we'll be there in just tonight's a um, garden myths is, um, is quite poignant to the last question and the last answer there by John, where a little is good, a lot is better. And, okay. Um, yep. And yes. So, so here we go. Uh, and basically, we've already mentioned it a couple of times tonight, haven't we? That you know people tend to overdo, and, and yes. that's what happened there. So we're going to look, if a little is good, a lot is better, at uh, about four different topics related to that. And the first one of those is about mulch. Uh, a little is good. What we're talking about good is maybe uh, five to seven centimetres thick. If you still think in widths, about like that. Okay. <laughs> about what I was doing um, in the uh, the. But what, you, what you're seeing in the picture there is mulch that's been put on at least twice or three times that, and that poor yellow thing in the middle is a rose, and that rose is dying um, uh, because people have piled the mulch on too thick. Whereas if you get it just right, here's another rose in the background there being mulched with a good mulch, just right, and the rose is very healthy. And there's another interesting point in that picture. Yes, yeah, so I was just about to say you can actually see the benefits of mulch there in um, preventing that those weeds coming through. There's a it's about the best photo you'll ever get to see unprotected soil there covered in weeds and the protected soil with the mulch serving multiple roles, but also the, one of the main mm. ones there is stopping that weed. Some might through. argue that's not a weed, but we'll leave that yeah. when we, <laughs> we bring Stephen McCabe onto <laughs> the panel <laughs> one day. Okay. Um, the next myth we're going to talk about in terms of a little is good, uh, a lot must be better, is fertiliser. And this is so very common. We get, uh, we have almost been conditioned to believe we need to fertilise everything all the time, and there can be a price to pay. We're not talking here about the environmental damage, which is huge, but we're talking about the damage to the plants themselves. Uh, so this picture is of a pear tree, uh, and fairly typically with a pear, somebody has gone in and they've heard this urban myth that you know if it doesn't fruit, if it doesn't flower, what you could do is pour on sulphate of potash, and they poured on sulphate of potash. And if you have a look at that foliage, you'll see it's pretty awful. It's actually suffering from a lack of phosphorus as a result of too much potash. Again, little is good, a lot is not necessarily better. And the other thing about putting on lots of fertiliser is you just promote new growth. Yeah, one of, the, one of the myths that will come up in spring is feed your plant up and get it ready for spring or summer. And, and the big problem, mm. of course, is that then you promote a lot of lush growth. The cell walls are stretching and suddenly you've got a big problem with um, aphids. Yep, or, or something or else, or other, yeah. other some <laughs> disease, yeah. Or at the some very way. least, they become very wimpy when it comes yes. to the hot weather and they start drooping and then everyone starts pouring more water on yeah. and then the cycle continues again. Whereas if you're balancing your fertiliser, your feeding program with the plant's needs, and this is critically important, what you will do is promote healthy growth as opposed to lush growth. Um, and, oh, water. Yeah, oh, um, yes. if a little is good, <laughs> let's drown them. Yes, absolutely. And well, this, let, let's be yes, fair, okay. this isn't Kalamara <laughs> and this is flood irrigation, but it does make the point. Absolutely. Uh, to, people do tend to overwater, and the classic is you'll see it in pots <clears throat> and hanging baskets, where particularly if they put a saucer underneath that yeah. pot, um, they'll, they'll basically fill that pot up, it gets stinky, horrible. But what it's actually doing is filling up those air spaces. And, and you look at that picture, now I know this is sort of a joke, but it's not really. There, there are some people who put almost that much water oh, yeah. on the sandy soils which are free draining, where it doesn't collect like that. Um, so we've got to be far more efficient in our use of water, and uh, this is one of the systems we recommend. This is what's called an integrated drip system. John, you're the irrigation expert. Oh, you better talk thanks. us through this. Okay, so this is inline drip. You can just see there those wetting patterns around or in the centre of each one of those circles there is a dripper. It's built into the line, hence inline drip irrigation. Pressure compensated, self-cleaning, couple of filters, very easy to do yourself. Now, a lot of people, they either in, have installed it incorrectly in the past or they, they don't understand how it waters. It, it drips very slowly uh, and very gently, and that's why you get those circles. Now, underneath that soil profile, you'll actually see that those wetting areas are, are soaked all the way through to that top 30 centimetres. Just if you see it dry on the top, it doesn't necessarily mean it's dry underneath. And, and of course. Yeah. I was going to actually add, and you see a lot of people say, well, 
shouldn't you be watering the base of the tree? What this does is actually spread the wetting pattern out so the roots can go out far and wide and collect the water from a range of areas. And yep. our deliberate mistake in that picture is it should, of course, be mulch, yes. but you couldn't, see, you, couldn't see you couldn't see the soap pattern if we did that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and just, our, last, our, our last section on this, if a little is good, a lot is better, is to do with organic matter, as we subtly referred to in that opening video on the program. Uh, this is a garden that uh, somebody is attempting to grow plants in almost pure sheep manure and compost. Yeah, nasty, nasty stuff. Uh, apart from the fact that it becomes very waterlogged, um, and again, waterlogged soil has no oxygen in it, so or very little, the plants struggle. And just the, the build-up of the, the fungal problems and, and, and bacteria mm -hmm. and, and collar rots, and you'll get all sorts of nasties, yep. real uh, bad garden nasties. Worth pointing out, it's a slow build-up. So at first, if you try and grow plants like your veggies in mm. this, they will bolt off. Wow, you think this is fantastic. Then, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's inevitable if you don't get, as John said, the good drainage. Mm. Um, so this is a uh, job to classify soils on television, but this is what a soil looks like that's got about 20% organic matter in it. If you look very closely at the picture, you can see grains of sand in there as well. And interesting, you can see how well that quite diverse plants in terms of their growth habits, the lettuce and the onion, both doing fairly well. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, most, most gardeners would think, well, you can't have those two together because, you know, we would normally go to one extreme for the lettuce and, then, of course, that has too much nitrogen for the onion. If you do it right, you can have the ba balance of the two yeah. be together. So there we are, a few of the uh, common myths, and we'll probably run a myth a week, I think, mm -hmm. uh, from Any now on. on. If you've got suggestions, by the way, about myths you'd like challenging, you too can drop them in. In fact, we're keen to hear your program ideas. Uh, and the email address, as ever, is tv I look, I look at beyondgardens.com.au. There we go. Uh, now, speaking of which, how are we going for time? We, uh, have we got time to address an email or two? Uh, we've actually got some callers. We've got some oh, callers. Lined up well, again. Yeah, the, the, okay. the phone lines are running hot again, so Excellent. thank you for getting in early. Um, do we have our first caller for the evening? Hello. Hello. G'day from Ray. Hello. Oh. Good day. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, okay. I have converted my uh, uh, street lawn to native, right. mm -hmm. and in between them, I like to weave a pattern of um, pumpkins or something along that line. And now I'm trying some sweet potatoes. Um, I'm doing a trench about the size of your fist if your thumb sticks above the surface. Can I give you a picture? And in the trench, I'm putting compost and mulch. Uh, sorry, compost and pot. And you have quoted that Western Australia uses a massive amount of fertiliser compared to the rest of the country. We do, unfortunately. So, yes. So do you think I need to add potato E to that or just let those natural ingredients be good enough for the sweet potato? Look, um... Potato E is one of those old-fashioned fertilisers. Uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but it's one of the old-fashioned ones that um, every gardener, if we go back about 30 years or so ago, and I can still just remember those times, had three bags of fertiliser in the garage. There was super <laughs> phosphate, potato E and blood and bone. Yeah. Oh, and maybe sulphate of ammonia. Including us carrot growers. So Including carrot growers, professional yeah. carrot growers use potato E a lot. Uh, the, the trouble with potato E is nowadays we don't call it a balanced fertiliser. So I would suggest that you maybe use the rest of it up. But the other point that's worth making is that sweet potato and normal potato, the only thing they share in common is the name. Um, in fact, the normal potato that we call, uh, Solanum tuberosum, that got its name from the sweet potato, which is Ipomoea batata. And when batata was mistranslated or misheard, it became potato. Long story, but anyway. <laughs> the net result is that if you're growing sweet potatoes, whilst they require a fairly similar level of nutrition, I would be applying it through afterwards, not before, not in the trench. I would be applying a, a complete general purpose fertiliser with trace elements. I, I would actually suggest that you've probably got enough nutrients already to kick the plant off and just wait till it's a bit older when it's starting when to actively grow when things warm up a bit. Yeah. And that's the time when we start pushing into the tuber all the, all the nutrients, and that's the time when it gets a bit hungry. So um, that would yeah. probably be the easiest way for you. And in fact, a lot of, lot of sprouting now. I uh, they, in are, the shops. Uh, they are. Look, it's worth looking at sweet potatoes. I mean, this is... Uh, 
don't really need a picture of sweet potatoes, but you get the idea. They are extremely vigorous. They are very productive. Um, I mean, all right, they're a filler, starchy food. They've got nothing special in them. But one of the um, sweet potatoes that perhaps we can talk about in more detail later again when Steve joins us is the native sweet potato. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, it's challenging, and it looks like it's going to be a great and productive vegetable for us in Western Australia. Thank you for your call. Okay. 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 So uh, you can call us. Ooh, yeah, a couple yes. of minutes before the <laughs> break. We're going to be break. back yep. for another half hour. Um, you can call us on our regular number, which is four... I get it wrong every time. John. Six four six, six four. eight five double nine four. You know, four. I think after nine weeks I'll get it. Oh, right. I wonder. I'll, <laughs> it's I'll, all right. I'll imprint it in here. I'll, I'll write it on the laptop. Okay. Um, we have another caller, do uh, we? Yes, we do. Hello, welcome to Beyond Gardens Live. Hello there. Hello. Who my name. Who my name is. I shouldn't talk over you. You go ahead. My name is Kim. Yes, Kim. Jim. Jim. Oh, Jimmy. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I'm hungry. I'm trying to get some. I'm getting some information regarding uh, fly blown ma mandarin tree. Mhm. Mm and I, I'd like to find a, a good, a good, uh, a good uh, something, something good that that will uh, kill the the, the the fruit fly. <clears throat> Okay, well, I think we had a, a similar problem last week, Jimmy, um, and the, the answer then was, well, we can't give you a guaranteed easy solution. Um, not that we ever could, but certainly one of the weapons in our armoury has now been taken away from us. Um, and although the fruit fly don't generally develop in mandarins, though occasionally they have been known to, it's the fact that the eggs have been laid in it that caused the tree to sense damage and drop. Um, so, um, I don't know, we can't. I'd love to offer at, you a cure. Yeah, exactly. At this time, um, at this time of the year, with the mandarins already on the tree, it's a little bit difficult. Um, exclusion netting, bags, and things like that will certainly stop them in the future. Uh, and there are some splash baits and traps and things like that. But if they've already been stung, there's nothing we can do at this stage with them. That's, and that's the big problem. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, uh, and so again, I think. I showed this picture last week, but just to give you an idea of what happens when you've got the citrus that's been stung, that is, an egg's been yes. laid in it, you get this uh, necrosis around where the egg was laid. The egg was laid in that little black point in the centre. Um, yeah. As I say, the, the maggots don't develop, but the tree senses the damage and drops the fruit. Uh, short, short of exclusion, uh, well, I mean, you can certainly be trapping all year round. That's yes. a very good yep. idea. Yep. Yep. Okay, Jimmy, hopefully that's yep. helped your question, and we have to take a break. Well, thank you very much. Good